so he said, why not? You know, I saw a title, and I thought this was something I'd be interested in. Didn't in, didn't know what to make of it. They got it. <laughs> I see. Well, so this is sixty to one hundred percent okay. increase in the total in the slice. For <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and get started. So Wei Feng has the full time. So thank you to, for coming to today's molecular and cellular neuroscience seminar. All right. So we're in for a treat today because we get to hear from one of our very own, Wei Feng Zhu. Um, as many of you know, Wei Feng has been interested in the molecular mechanisms that mediate synaptic plasticity and changes in neuronal synapses. Um, she did her PhD studies at Brown University in Diane Lipskin's lab, where she studied the biology of L-type calcium channels and how they function in neurons. Um, she became heavily focused on synaptic plasticity, actually, at Stanford, where she worked with Rob Malinka. Um, while in Rob's lab, she did very important studies on PSD95 and the PSD95 family. She also developed a really nice toolkit for knocking out endogenous genes within um, mammalian neurons and replacing them with mutated variants. They really opened up structure function studies in, in mammalian neurons. She joined the Picaro Institute in the BCS department in 2009 as an assistant professor. And since arriving here, Wei Feng has sort of considered, con continued her studies on synaptic plasticity, working on molecular mechanisms that change both functional aspects of synapses as well as neural excitability. She's won several awards during her early career, including a K99 Pathway to Independence Award from the NIH and a Whitehead Career Development Professorship. And today she's going to be telling us about some of her current work on the synaptic protein neurogranin and how it regulates synaptic plasticity. What do you think? Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to present my work, and it's even better when I'm presenting it to an uh, in house seminar to talk to people that I know uh, in a day to day life. So today, uh, well, let's start it with my title. I must have a really good title because John Lisman sitting in the audience from Brandeis. Yay. So um, I chose this, purposely chose this title. And then I, I kind of saw this uh, keyword change. And then I couldn't help to put up this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because of the, the time of the year and then things going on on the television a couple of nights ago. And uh, as you can see here that uh, even though this is Obama, it changes, but uh, fundamentally it's still Obama in a socialist type of uh, image. And then like somebody else will try to become Obama <laughs> using the s similar image, but uh, the underlying message is not, no, no, we don't want that. And to, yeah, so basically he's pretending that he's working for 100% well, He's only working for the 50% of the, the um, I don't know, the top cream, top crust or the bottom crust of the cake. Anyway, <laughs> I hope this is not a completely inappropriate joke because I'm a Chinese and, and this is American politics. <laughs> anyway, so, but I want to kind of bring you back to what I really want to uh, use this freeze for. I um, kind of hijacked this freeze. Nothing endures but change from uh, Asian um, Greek um, philosopher Heraclitus. I'm not sure if I pronounce it right. Basically, um, and this is like a, a kind of well-known quote that 
a man will never step twice into the same water because the river will not be the same and the man is never the same the moment from previous moment. So um, I want to use this to um, kind of highlight that um, the brain is a really dyna dynamic network and the neurons experience moment to moment fluctuation of their membrane properties and their cytosolic content that will influence their detection and the expression of the uh, information that's coming through the nervous system. And um, so that's basically the overarching um, kind of um, theme that I'm working on. And today I'm going to particularly talk about a very, uh, somebody told me it's a very obscure neuronal protein called neuroglandin that they don't know even what it is until it they see it in my title. It's a very little tiny neuronal protein. And I'm going to tell you about its um, regulation of neuroglandin neurons in response to um, animal behavior and the neuronal activity and how we think that it may, might impact the uh, neuronal properties and, uh, and in consequence they, uh, they, uh, they uh, read out the functional readout of the uh, neuronal network. So I'll start with um, the, my introduction as my um, understanding of the, of the nervous system at a neuron point of view. I consider neuron as a unit for signal uh, propagation. Basically, it's uh, composed of the uh, dendritic tree that receiving um, input from axonal efferent from other brain regions. Uh, this is a um, kind of a, a model cell. You can consider it as a CA1 pyramidal cell or a uh, projection neurons in cortical area as well. So Afrin comes in and it makes connections to, um, uh, to synapses and this is a primarily excitatory glutaminergic um, um, cells that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so the uh, reset uh, synapses are where um, neurons talk to each other that Afrin coming in making synapses onto the postsynaptic cell and then uh, neurotransmitter release will release uh, will induce um, depolarization of the postsynaptic um, neurons. And then this um, excitatory postsynaptic potential will travel through the dendritic tree to the cell body, and the information gets integrated at, at the soma. And then uh, the uh, the computation of the integrated um, EPSPs eventually decide whether it will generate a action potential or an action potential train at the uh, axon holic um, axon initiation segment um, as the output of this neuron. And uh, so. The information flow, the main information flow is this one direction, but um, the uh, action potential generated at SOMA can back propagate into the dendritic tree, and then the local EPSPs will influence the local excitability of the membrane that will influence the reception of the neurons as well. So um, they, um, as you can see that they, uh, the the function, the functionality of neuron is primarily described by the membrane properties, the electrical signal of the neurons, and the changing, changes in EPSP, EPSP, uh, the synaptic connection strength, and then the changes in the integration of the uh, electrical signal, and um, eventually changes in action potential, uh, frequency, and output will influence the functionality of the neuron. So that's our membrane properties. And um, from my heart, and then from my PhD work, I know that calcium is important. Calcium is essential for regulating neuronal functions. Actually, I used to have a periodic table that's filled up with calcium, only calcium, no, nothing else, <laughs> just for the sake of it. Calcium is essential because um, it's a very important secondary messenger that would um, translate the um, the uh, electrical signal into a, um, into the um, um, set intracellular signaling cascade, activate the intracellular signaling cascade, and induce changes um, regulations of membrane properties. And, and so, uh, needless to say, there are a list of enzymes that's um, dependent on calcium influx, including chem kinase, PP2B, and uh, adenylate cyclases, and, and the list can go on and on. And, um, so there are also membrane um, proteins that can be directly regulated by calcium. Uh, for instance, voltage-cated calcium channels, a variety of calcium-sensitive potassium channels, and uh, KCNQ channels, which is normally known in neurons as end current. So, um, 
So to this audience, I don't have to um, emphasize, but I just want to kind of bring everybody on the same page that calcium calmoduline mediates an MD receptor dependent bidirectional synaptic plasticity that I have been working on through my postdoc, um, postdoctoral um, career and I'm still working on in my lab. Um, and then the basic hypothesis and uh, experimental support is like this, that a, a strong calcium influx through NMDA receptors will um, um, recruit um, calmodulin binds to calcium that eventually leads to a constitutive activation of chem kinase 2 that leads to the phosphorylation of MPA receptor or its auxiliary subunits in, um, induce the enhancement of synaptic transmission. Whereas um, a uh, moderate or weak um, activation of synaptic NMD receptor leads to a moderate calcium influx that recruits certain, uh, a smaller concentration of calmodulin that's saturated by calcium and activate PP2B phosphatase pathways that eventually leads to the uh, dephosphorylation of AMPA receptor and its auxiliary subunit and a decreased synaptic transmission known as uh, depre long-term depression. And then this um, bidirectional um, NMD receptor dependent uh, plasticity is a model system for a well-known the theoretical plasticity, Habian type of plasticity, uh, playing out as the uh, conditional, uh, a uh, coherent co conditional stimulants will induce a uh, potentiation of the synaptic strength, whereas uh, less coherent or um, um, uh, conditional stimulus will induce a decrease of LTD. And as uh, it's, it is well il illustrated by um, Shawu um, when he was working with Mark, um, this um, x-axis can be, in this case, can certainly translate it as a calcium influx um, instead of the conditional stimulus. So more calcium LTP, less calcium LTD. And in this model, I want to uh, say that um, so the calcium, uh, the, uh, the level of calcium is primarily dependent on the amount of calcium that going through an MD receptor. So um, the, uh, the influx, the size of the influx is primarily dependent on conditional stimulus. Um, so I just want to um, kind of remind you that um, calcium calmodulin not only is uh, the key uh, mediator for NMD receptor dependent on um, plasticity, the influx of calcium can also influence the uh, membrane ion channels that could potentially influence the spine excitability and also whole cell level of excitability through um, um, activating or inactivating certain type of calcium sensitive ion ionic conductance. So, um, and then the protein that I'm going to introduce you to called neuroguanin, and it intersects the uh, calcium, cal cal calcium calmodulin signaling right at, at calcium entry level. It is a highly, um, neuroguanin expresses a rel uh, relatively high level in the neurons, and it's at a, uh, um, in a uh, kind of similar concentration as calmodulin. Calmodulin normally ex expressed by 60 to 100 micromolar. Neurogranin expression uh, fluctuated by this, um, at a similar uh, kind of um, um, levels. And neurogranin is special because it binds to calmodulin under low calcium condition, unlike the effector proteins of calcium calmodulin normally has an increased affinity when cal calmodulin is bound to calcium. And it's thought um, working as a calcium, uh, a calmodulin buffer that uh, titrate calmodulin from calcium. However, it releases calmodulin when calcium concentration is elevated upon stimulation. Calmodulin is the only known interaction partner of neuroguanin. Um, so, and the neuroguanin regulates calcium uh, calmodulin interactions in a dose dependent manner as a tri partner interaction. And I simplify the story by not telling you that neurogranin is also a PKC substrate. And there is also oxidation um, reaction, post translational uh, modification of neurogranin, which function is uh, relatively unknown that can potentially complicate the story uh, to another degree. So um, all I'm saying is that by regulating neurogranin levels, that we can actually uh, regulate the calcium calmodulin 
availability, the dynamics of this interaction dramatically. And then that's the take home message I want to um, kind of trying to tell you that neural grinding is a master regulator of calcium calmodulin dynamics. That without influencing the uh, influx of calcium, just by simply regulating neural grinding levels, one can potentially change the calcium sensitivity of the system. Just to give you a little bit more background of neural grinding, uh, as I said, it's a small neuronal uh, protein. It, it has a very interesting and sometimes convenient properties for, for us to work, out, work with. It's highly expressed in multiple brain regions, including cortex, hippocampus, and striatum, and some um, area that um, I, I know that it highlights part of amygdala, but I'm not going to point to it because I'm not completely sure where it is. <laughs> Sorry, Kai. <laughs> no offense, but I know it's very important, that's why I'm saying it. So, uh, yeah. very, very high in, uh, over here, yeah, inferior colliculus and some uh, cerebellar structure as well. So, um, it's, its localization is primarily postsynaptic, uh, meaning that it's in the soma dendrite, and then it's also in the postsynaptic compartment, but it's not in the axonal uh, compartment, it's not in the presynaptic terminal. There is actually a, a counterpart of neurogranin in the presynaptic terminal cut, GAP43, that has been shown regulating calcium, um, um, calcium channels in the presynaptic terminal. It's a very small protein, it's only 78 amino acid. But the messenger uh, is, um, is over a KB long, has a very extensive 5' prime and 3' prime UTR uh, region that potentially um, uh, carries some modulatory um, element in it. So um, I want to stress that it's only in projection neurons and um, in pyramidal cells and in striatum, in the case of striatum, in medium spiny neurons. But it's not in the interneurons. Um, so it actually makes our analysis somewhat um, easier to a certain degree. And um, so over the years, people have um, looked at this protein, even though it's obscure. Um, uh, people have made uh, the knockout animals of neurogranin. And then, um, so this is a, a Huang group from NIH. And then they show, the uh, knockout animals show a uh, uh, learning def deficit in Morris vortimase. And then the recent study also showed that they have shown um, um, deficit in contextual fear conditioning. And at a uh, mechanistic level, there are um, um, observations that uh, LTP is deficient in this particular knockout line, but in an, a different um, knockout line, the readout is actually different. So the calcium dynamic is um, altered. There's a, um, a reduced level of uh, phosphorylation of 286, chem kinase 2, 286 um, site, which is a um, indicative of active uh, alpha chem kinase 2. And more interestingly, uh, Huang group also looked at the uh, heterozygous and the wild type animals because I think it's because of the noise of their analysis. And then they, they actually show a very nicely a positive correlation between hippocampal neurogranny levels and the performance on the uh, Morris Vortimase task, suggest, strongly suggesting that um, Function, functional wise neurogranny is positively correlated with the learning performance. And then it is also true with the wild type littermate they are studying. As I have um, implicated that um, neurogranny expression is um, highly regulated. Previous studies have been focusing on long term manipulations over hours, months, uh, days, or like uh, throughout the um, animal's lifetime. And there are um, regulatory elements in the genome sequence uh, in neurogranin genes that uh, respond to thyroid hormone or retinoic acid um, uh, regulation. And behaviorally, um, it can be up or down regulated depending on the uh, specific uh, uh, behavioral par paradigm you're using. And pathologically, recently, neurogranin has been identified as a uh, potential uh, candidate gene for schizophrenia as uh, several uh, SNPs has been identified in uh, neurogranin, uh, upstream from the neurogranin gene with a uh, uh, risk, um, high risk in the uh, schizophrenia population. So um, we are particularly interested in this gene, this protein, 
is because of its intersection of the calcium calmodulin um, uh, pathway. And where the link with schizophrenia suggests that um, by regulating neuroglandin, it will shift the uh, neuronal network function towards a pathological condition. So what I'm not showing you is a lot of fishing experiment that Ken has done when he started uh, the postdoctoral um, um, career in my lab. So we basically run a wild type animal, wild type mice in a, a variety of a behavioral paradigm that's related with uh, schizophrenia psycho or psychosis. And what we have found is that it basically, the first observation we made was that neurogranin levels varies a lot from animal to animal, from day to day, from like, which is a like, pretty frustrating in the beginning, but then we eventually pin it down and, and we kind of reasoned that it must be neurogranin is very sensitive to behavior stimulation, like some other immediate early genes that people have studied. And so we started to very be, become, Ken, by way, most of the time I mean Ken, become really disciplined about handling the animal, habituate the animal, and then do exactly the same thing day after the day. And eventually we started to pin down the, uh, how we can control the neurogranin level uh, expression in the animals. And then, um, so after all these, um, about three to six months of trouble, worth of trouble to get rid of the uh, biological kind of um, the uh, variance in the system. The first observation I want to show you is this exper experience regulate uh, increase dependent upregulation of neurogranin in hippocampus. So this is a very simple experiment. We habituate the animal with kin, so animals are not afraid of kin. And then after three to five days, he takes the animal into a behavioral box that's um, decorated with a very contrasty wallpaper. And then he leaves the animal in that, uh, in that environment for eight minutes. And then take, it, take, take the animal out and put it back in the home cage for the animal to recover for another seven minutes. And I will remind you that this is like a 15 minutes in total experiment. Um, which took him several months before he reaches this um, level of significance. Uh, at six, 15 minutes, he uh, sacrificed the animal and dissected the brain, take out the hippocampus within half a minute or one minute. And then he basically matched the hippocampus and take the protein, uh, protein, total protein and run it on a Western blot using neurogranin or tubulin antibody to uh, detect the signal. Tubulin is just basically a loading control. And what you can see here is that if, he, if the animal is habituated to can, then they are uh, no exposure, just home cage for 15 minutes, and the, the um, neurogranin stays at 100%. Whereas if the animal gets to exposed to a novel environment for simply eight minutes, then by 50 minutes of uh, time, you would see about 50% upregulation of neurogranin level from total cell lysate, from total complete a whole hippocampus. Okay, so um, I want to come back to tell you why that's kind of striking. And as I said, that handling the animal causes the neurogranin signal varies uh, varies a lot. So we think that stress or fear might be a factor that influences neurogranin expression. And then, uh, so we kind of um, um, kind of uh, hijacked the um, genetically coded fear system of the rodents. That rodents are inherently fear uh, afraid of fox. So Ken got some fox urine from his uh, mom's um, garden uh, variety tools because they act he actually ordered it from Amazon, if I believe it, because they use this to, uh, to scare away rodents out of the backyard. And, but we do this in the hood so our whole room does not smell like fox. So in the hood, if the animals smell fox urine for 15 minutes, uh, neurogranin levels goes up by 50% <coughs> in hippocampus. And um, so we did a similar, uh, not similar, but we did a acute stress test in, um, an, in mouse using um, forced swim test. And we see a similar type of upregulation of neurogranin in striatum as well. So um, in this case, I 
don't think it's a hippocampus specific effect, but hippocampus does respond to fear induced um, upregulation of neuroguanine. And we can recapitulate this effect by simply injecting, your, uh, injecting the mouse um, IP injection of IP, epinephrine, which is the fear, um, flight and fight uh, kind of uh, hormone or neurotransmitter. 30 minutes um, later after the injection, we see a significant uh, upregulation of neuroguanine. So I want to pause a little bit before I go into the uh, uh, mechanistic um, study on how neuroguanine level is regulated by pointing out why this, dis why this um, finding is um, exciting and interesting. So um, changes of gene expression uh, in animals that responding to a certain stimulation or behavior paradigm is not novel. Uh, people have studied immediate early gene expression for decades and decades. It's older than me. So, but, um, and then, uh, so not only immediate early genes, there are also studies on activity dependent translation of certain genes at synapses that's kind of uh, in, implicated in synaptic plasticity and learning and memory. So, why would we get so kind of excited about the, um, the, the discovery we found in neuroguanine, I think there are two key points. One is that the time course that we're seeing is actually very short. We didn't realize that until we started to go back and look at more gene regulation uh, um, expression studies in the literature. And we found that most of the study, I want to say most because I know that some, um, well, at least one person will disagree with me. Uh, most of the study look at immediate early genes. And they look at mRNA um, transcription and then that normally is detectable 30 to 60 minutes after stimulation. There are exceptions, but um, most of the immediate early genes are, um, has a um, 30 to 60 minutes delay at mRNA level after the behavior stimulation, fear conditioning, epilepsy, so on and so forth, and the CPG genes as well, I think. And the protein levels, the translation of these mRNAs comes even later. And there is, are nice studies on CAMK2, which is a uh, prominent candidate for activity-dependent translation that's involved in synaptic plasticity. And uh, the upregulation of CAMK2 comes up about 30 to 60 minutes after stimulation. And this is a uh, kind of, uh, uh, the stim by stimulation, one particular example is the dark reared uh, animal that gets exposed to light and looking at expression of CAMK2 at synaptosomal preparation from visual cortex. So it's locally upregulated within 30, uh, after 30 minutes after the behavior stimulation. So by 50 minutes of uh, the animal seeing the novel environment and having a 50% upregulation of total protein level is actually quite striking. And also the second point I want to make is that the increases in total protein level is not at the synapto, uh, we don't know where it starts but just the, by the detection method, it's, um, it's, it's total protein level 50%. If it happens to be localized to certain population of the neuron or certain part of the neuron, the increase will be even more than 50%. We don't know about that. We need to do experiments to test that. So, um, and then so this is not a immediate early gene. The basal level is quite high. It's, as I said, it's as high as calmodulin. That means it's not something that it only comes up during activity. It's almost like a thermometer that senses the activity and up and down regulates its levels according to what the animal's behavior is uh, experiencing. So it has its um, kind of a similarity of this activity dependent uh, regulation towards other uh, activity dependent genes like immediate early genes, but it has its own properties of being really, really sensitive that has a t very fast time course. And then it's, um, it, it's not from zero to 100. It's, it's from one to 1 1.5, but that, that concentration change can mean a lot towards this system. So um, the first question um, Ken wanted to ask is how neurogranny is upregulated in the, in the neurons to look at the, uh, the mechanistic uh, regulation of the uh, expression of neuroguanine. To do that, we uh, 
we uh, kind of converted back to a simple model system of dissociated cortical neuron culture. So basically, we take the neurons out of the, uh, um, uh, the P1, um, red brain in this case, and we plate it on the dish and let it to grow and elaborate its uh, neurons over two to three weeks period of time. And then we uh, treat the culture with a certain pharmacological manipulations to upregulate up the excitatory neuronal um, um, activity by inhibiting inhibition using bicuculin. So in this particular experiment, so basically the question, the simple question we are asking is that just by simply increasing excitatory drive, would we be able to increase neurogranin levels? And if we do in culture system, what kind of time, time scale uh, are we looking at? So here is just showing the time course that we um, apply by cuculin, we, by we, we mean can, um, apply by cuculin to the culture and we collect the, uh, the cell lysate at a, a, um, a variety of time point. As you can see that there is a uh, um, ramping up of the expression of neuroguanin by 50 minutes, it uh, reaches to a significant point, and by 30 minutes it comes down. I know that if he does 20 more preparation, this probably will become uh, significant, but I'm not going to kill him by doing that. So, um, and as I said, fear cause upregulation of neuroguanin in uh, behaving animals. So we simply asked whether neuroepinephrine will do the same thing in culture. So in this experiment, we either treat the culture with bicuculin alone for 15 minutes or neuroepinephrine alone for 10 minutes. Or we combine bicuculin and neuroepinephrine to treat culture by, uh, for 10 minutes. And you can see here that bicuculin faithfully increase neuroguanin levels. Neuroepinephrine alone in culture system does not uh, have an effect on neurogranin levels. But if we co-apply neuroepinephrine with speculin, then we see a significant increase in neurogranin levels at even at 10 minutes of application of these drugs. So we think the adrenergic receptor facilitate this process uh, increase, uh, of increased neurogranin expression. And we validated the uh, increase of neurogranin expression also by immunostaining, uh, looking at control versus uh, stimulated culture. And the green is uh, my uh, favorite molecule, PSC95, highlights the uh, synaptic uh, component of the neuron. And then red is neurogranin. You can see that, uh, so uh, you get a garden variety of neurons when you're in culture. So you you want to uh, look at a, an array of expression, but uh, consistently you see upregulation of the red signal, which is the neurogranin, um, endogenous neurogranin signal throughout the neurons. And sometimes you see a co-localization of neurogranin in the, uh, in the synaptic, postsynaptic compartment as well. So the obvious question we want to ask is whether this increase in neurogranin is translational or transcriptional dependent. So we use a transcription um, inhibitor actinomycin D to uh, pre-treat the culture for 30 minutes and then do the bicuculin treatment. And we see uh, both in the bicuculin condition and then the uh, combined cocktail condition. And here uh, we're sh uh, I'm showing that actinomycin D does not uh, block the upregulation of um, activity and neuroepinephrine induced upregulation of neuroguanin. However, when we use a translation inhibitor uh, cyclohexamide, then uh, we can abolish the uh, upregulation of neuroguanin both in the bicuculin and in the cocktail condition, suggesting the neuroguanin increase is dependent on, on new translation. And um, we used, an, so with the help of, of uh, Miriam Hyman, we did uh, a crude polyribosome analysis to look at the binding of polyribosome on neurogranin mRNA. So this is an alternative way to say it's an upregulation of newly synthesized neurogranin, um, but rather a uh, decrease of degradation of existing neuroguanin. So as you know, proteins uh, cycles and then there's uh, translation, there's a degradation. Blocking degradation can also um, exhibit a upregulation of neuroguanin levels. So we did MG132 experiment, which is a proteosomal uh, inhibitor. Uh, we do not block the upregulation, but that's still indirect evidence. So, um, 
So the uh, experiment here we are doing is basically isolating mRNA uh, species that bound to polyribosome that will have a higher density that can be separated from the uh, uh, naked mRNA or mRNAs that bound very few ribosome using sucrose cushion and then using qPCR to detect the uh, percentage of the messenger RNA that um, has a neuroguanine specific signal comparing to the constitutive messages like GAPDH18S, I think also tubulin and actin, so on and so forth. And we also throw in the part of the two uh, candidate of activity dependent uh, translation, trans translation KMK2 and ARC as a comparison. So at the bottom is the homogenate data. If you just uh, make a good old, uh, total RNA preparation and do qPCR, there's no difference. Um, so basically, this is a total change with neuroguanine over bicuculin stimulation. So we're ratioing the bicuculin treated uh, messenger RNA neuroguanine signal over the, uh, um, the material that coming out of control material and we don't see a significant upregulation. Whereas um, for the polyribosome um, enriched fraction, we see a significant upregulation of neuroguanine um, signals using two different specific primers. I think there is a trend of upregulation of KMK2 and ARC is not reaching significance. I think it might be if we increase the N. I think currently the, it's four to six uh, data set at this point. These are from culture work. So basically, this is a, uh, um, a, an alternative way to show that it's uh, upregulation of translation rather than a uh, um, uh, downregulation of degradation. And then to dwell into the signaling cascade, I'm just going to flash through quite a few slides. Um, obviously, we're interested in whether this upregulation of neuronal activity recruit an MDA receptor, and then that's uh, in the pathway of the up, uh, to induce the uh, neurogranin translation. And then when we uh, pre-treat the culture with APV, we can block the upregulation of neurogranin, suggesting an MDA receptor activation is involved. And then another calcium source at the postsynaptic compartment is voltage-gated calcium channel that close to my heart, unfortunately, or fortunate, and or fortunately. Um, using an L-type calcium channel blocker as radipine pretreatment, we cannot block the upregulation of neuroguanin with this treatment. If there's anything, there's a trend of upwards regulation, which is interesting. Uh, so it's really an MD receptor. With this, with this specific stimulation paradigm, an MD receptor is required for the upregulation of neuroguanine, but L-type calcium channel is not. Um, so activity-dependent uh, translation of a lot of, uh, of uh, neuronal candidate gene has been suggested that depends on ERK signaling pathway. So we did the ERK inhibitor. It blocks the, um, blocks the upregulation of uh, neurogranin in both of the conditions. So ERK is in the pathway. And then, so the next uh, slide is interesting, but it's probably only interesting to certain uh, people because it's a uh, aficionados will find this um, quite um, interesting. So mTOR has been strongly suggested but it has been controversial in the field of activity-dependent translation of neuronal genes, whether it's involved in or it's not. Depending on who you are talking to, somebody, some are in the uh, strong believer camp, some are on the uh, non-believer camp. So um, when we did the bicuculin experiment, actually Li Hui suggested or was curious about whether mTOR pathway is involved in this, um, in, in this process. So we uh, treated the culture with rapamycin, which is mTOR pathway inhibitor. And then to our surprise, to a certain degree, uh, when I look, at, look back at the literature, I'm not as surprised. The rapamycin treatment does not block bicuculin-induced upregulation of neuroguanin. And when we did the uh, co-application of bicuculin neuroepinephrine, it's like, well, you know, it's a control experiment, but you have to do it. And to our it's amazing when we saw this and then like uh, that rapamycin now completely um, abolished the uh, 
cocktail-induced upregulation of neuroguanin in, um, in the culture system. So it suggests that uh, if with an NMDA receptor activation alone, you only require the ERK signaling pathway to, that's enough to upregulate neuroguanin translation. But if you have adrenergic receptor coming in and somehow it will deter the signaling pathway toward the mTOR pathway, and then actually ERK is still required, but mTOR can completely account for this upregulation. So it's not like we are bringing this back from 150% to 130%. It brings it back to 100%. So whatever this pathway, the mysterious pathway of mTOR independent, ERK dependent translation pathway is required in this condition is spared when mTOR comes into the play. So this is, as I said, this is um, very kind of mechanistic. It will interest certain people, but not. I think it's a very satisfying result in our hand because we think that we finally kind of started to dissect out some controversy that existing in the field. So before I go into the functional uh, study, I want to summarize a little bit that we saw, we think that uh, neurogranin levels can be uh, upregulated by rapid uh, activity-dependent translation that going through NMD receptor activation uh, through uh, ERK signaling pathway. An adrenergic receptor can facilitate this uh, process and recruit mTOR pathway to uh, further enhance the translation of neuroguanin. So the uh, burning question is uh, what neuroguanin does and what the changes in neuroguanin levels in neuron will do to the neuron. So um, to answer this, this question, we uh, employed the uh, virus-mediated gene manipulation that. Uh, um, that now many labs are using to study neuronal functions. We can either overexpress a fusion protein, um, neurogranin infused to GFP, um, or we can uh, knock down the endogenous uh, neurogranin with the shRNA while expressing GFP to identify infected cells. And to test the efficiency of these constructs, we infect the uh, cortical neuron cultures with viruses and then do Western blot. As you can see here, the overexpression gives you a significant uh, neuroguanin EGFP signaling. These are both um, blotted with neuroguanin antibody, so the intensity gives you a certain uh, sense about the relative amount. So you would see it's like a double or triple the amount of the endogenous neuroguanin. And when the shRNA is expressed, we can pretty much wipe out the neuroguanin, um, endogenous neuroguanin by 80 to 90%. And uh, we um, use a um, hippocampal slice culture um, as the first pass for functional assay. Um, there's uh, several advantages, um, and the biggest one is that we could do uh, simultaneous pair recordings, so we're eliminating variabilities of uh, slice to slice and animal to animal variation. And so basically, we took P7 red uh, hippocampal slices and uh, put it on a culture insert, and then inject virus after three days after in vitro, and we record five to seven days after the uh, injection. And we can identify the infected neuron by the uh, green fluorescent. And then they, um, they, uh, um, the overall cytal architect of the hippocampus is preserved in the hippocampal organotypic slices. So, um, First pass, we looked at the um, um, synaptic transmission using, actually in this case, current clamp, um, recording uh, method. So basically, we are patching onto two neurons, one infected, the other one is not. And uh, with one stimulation electrode stimulating the same efferent bundle, and then look at, simply ask whether these two cells exhibit uh, different re uh, synaptic response. And um, so in this case, overexpression of neuroguanin gives you uh, enhanced uh, um, synaptic transmission. So every uh, gray dot is a pair of cells with uninfected response plotted on x-axis, infected cell plotted on the y-axis. Anything that above the equity line is an increase, anything below is a decrease. And then the black symbol is the um, um, uh, mean and standard arrow. So if the black symbol lies above the line, then that means it's increase when it lies Underneath the line, it's a decrease. So overexpressive neuroguanin increases the uh, synaptic transmission moderately. 
and uh, knocking down neurogranulin decreased the uh, synaptic trans transmission moderately, 40 to 40 to 60 percent. So, um, and then as I keep saying in my introduction, calcium signaling will influence membrane excitability. So we look at the excitability um, more carefully using current uh, clamp um, uh, technique. So basically, we um, hold down the cell and give a depolarizing uh, current steps from 50, from 50 uh, picoam up to 100 picoam. And then we just simply count the spike number with the depolarization. So this is a, a sample trace that the red is a neurogranin overexpressing cell and then the black is a control cell. You cannot see really clearly, but the, uh, just believe me that the red has the more spikes comparing to the control. And uh, so because then we, kind of, we plotted all the cells um, on a uh, heat map. The heat uh, is the uh, numbers of spikes, and then uh, cells are grouped as control group and neurogranin overexpression group. You can see that uh, the neurogranin overexpression cells are hotter uh, at um, a variety of uh, current injection steps. And if we plot this um, current injection versus number of spike um, a relationship, you can see a very nice um, Boltzmann-like curve that neurogranin overexpression cell is shifting leftward, leftwards, suggesting that um, smaller current injection will induce more action potential and uh, uh, increased neuronal excitability. And we did the same thing um, with um, neurogranin knockdown and we saw an opposite, uh, moderate but opposite um, effect that uh, knocking down neurogranin decreased the heat of the uh, action potential train. And it get, the plot gets colder, and then the, um, the, um, the uh, curve is shifted uh, rightwards, suggesting that with a similar, uh, same kind of um, current injection, neurogranin knockdown, knockdown my uh, uh, neurons uh, tends to fire less action potential. So, and I just want to kind of um, link these together. So far, I have shown that um, increase in neuronal activity or experience would, um, so in cultural work, we showed a mechanistic study of how neurogranin levels can be upregulated. But uh, the take home message is that novel environment or enhanced neural activity or stress can enhance neurogranin levels. I've shown you primarily in hippocampal uh, brain region but with stress, we, can, we saw that in other brain regions as well. And then uh, by uh, artificially manipulating neurogranin levels, enhanced neurogranin level can enhance EPSP. Other people have shown that enhanced EPSC by overexpression neurogranin um, can, is dependent on NMDA receptor activity, suggesting that it's probably through a LTP signaling cascade. And here we, show, we also show that enhancing neurogranin levels can enhance the uh, neuronal excitability, presumably by modulating calcium sensitive conductance, but we don't know what identity of those um, yet. So uh, they, uh, then this seems to be a kind of a positive feedback loop, if you will, to uh, jump ahead that the enhanced EPSP and enhanced excitability will translate into uh, increased uh, neuronal activity in the network that presumably will kick this into a positive feedback loop. And we did it, um, so the, our current working hypothesis that this pretty much opened up the gate for information flowing through the network that eventually leads to the enhancement of learning. Although you can see it's dotted line, we haven't made the final connection yet. So the final piece of evidence I want to show you is very correlative. Um, and we are doing the last bit of a perturbation study trying to pin down whether that's the case. So we are coming back to this uh, novel environment. And so um, Fenslow's group has developed a, 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 a variation of the context of fear conditioning paradigm that uh, they, uh, uh, most of other groups are using to separate the context of memory from the association of the shock. And then what he has shown in his earlier work is that if you expose the animal in the, in the shocking chamber for a period of time, it will form a context memory. And if you bring in the animal back a day later and shock at that point, 
then the animal will actually immediately associate with the shock with the context because the animal recognized the context. And then uh, if you bring the animal back 30 minutes later or a day later, the animal will remember the context um, based upon the uh, initial, the previous um, uh, formation of the context memory. And he also nicely showed that the initial uh, context memory formation is dependent on translation. If he perfused the animal half an hour ahead of the time before he exposed the animal to the context, then the animal will not remember even though you do the shock 24 hours later. So this is a nice paradigm that separating the context memory formation, protein synthesis dependent context memory formation from the association of the shock. And we thought that's a nice way for us to actually look at the uh, context dependent upregulation of um, neural grinding, how that's involved in um, uh, learn, uh, uh, learning and memory of the animal. So this is a very first path of behavior experiment Chris, uh, Chris did um, when he started um, um, his um, technician position in my lab, just to um, kind of testing some baseline condition, whether this uh, parameter works and whether we can use it. So the first experiments he did is that to do a short exposure, two minutes exposure in the shocking chamber versus eight minutes exposure in the shocking chamber. And with a prolonged eight minutes exposure, the animal will uh, be able to learn the context and then remember the shock and showing by the freezing um, behavior uh, at the 30 minutes after the shock test. And then the next behavior we wanted to ask is whether epinephrine induced upregulation of neural grain is, in, is uh, important for this learning. So, and then again, this is a uh, kind of a, a baseline testing to see whether the, uh, the um, um, uh, paradigm works. So basically, um, as, you, as you have seen here and also here, that if we inject the saline ahead of time and put the animal exposed to the context for two minutes, um, the animal would not remember the context. But if we pre-inject the animal with epinephrine and then the short two minutes exposure can now um, form a uh, context memory and then the animal will remember the uh, context and then freeze uh, at the testing point. And this is, um, this is not new. We're just basically testing to see whether this behavior paradigm will work in our hand. And then this paradigm was recently used by Melanos group to look at GLUR1 phosphorylation, yeah, um, whether emotional um, stimulation using epinephrine will induce GLUR1 phosphorylation and then uh, facilitate this type of learning. And then this is the correlation I want to show you. So Ken used uh, primarily pretty much the first half an hour of this um, behavior paradigm, simply ask what neural grinding will do in this context. Is there any correlation between the animal behavior versus the, uh, the neural grinding expression level? So, and then part of the data is actually, like all of the data are actually just a repetition of the initial observation, but we're doing it in a more controlled uh, fashion to show you here that eight minutes exposure to the context upregulating neural grinding levels and IP plus two upregulate neural granule levels. IP injection alone increased the uh, hippocampus uh, neural granule levels as well, which is not surprising because animals are moving around. There are neuronal activity going on. Maybe the combination of the IP plus the regular neuronal activity is enough to push the uh, neural granule level up. But at this point, it does not really um, mean anything because it's overall upregulation. And we know this upregulation is context dependent and is hippocampus specific. So uh, in this case, he took cortex or striatum um, out of these animals and then did Western blood to ask whether is this just an overall brain phenotype or it's a hippocampal specific phenotype. And here he shows that if he just look at the total cortical lysate, the uh, neural granule levels is rock solid across the conditions. And with a striatum, uh, so there are some variabilities in a novel environment, and IP gives a slight up, upward shift of the neural granule levels, but it's not significant, suggesting if the animal is experiencing novel environment or having some stress signal, neural granule would be fluctuating in striatum, but it's not as dramatic as hippocampus. 
So um, the data, I will stop all the data here. As I said that we're going to do perturbation perturbation studies directly in hippocampus to see if we block the upregulation of neurogranin in hippocampus, whether we'll be able to block the IP-induced, um, uh, IP-facilitated context memory formation. So I have five minutes and um, I just want to give you a summary and um, I think um, I, I think the study so far brings out more questions than answers. But just by, I just want to simplify the picture as our working hypothesis is that uh, upregulation of neuroguanin by um, um, incoming enhanced neuronal activity worked as a f positive feedback loop to enhance synaptic transmission, enhance the excitability that presumably uh, can shift the uh, this is probably via shifting the uh, uh, LTP threshold, if you would say, uh, if you would. And I don't want to put words in Mark, uh, Mark's mouth, but I think it's a potential metaplasticity molecule, but it's the potentiation of potentiation rather than the traditional metaplasticity uh, one can think of as a downregulating a potentiated synapse. So it's really, uh, at this point, our working hypothesis is a positive feedback loop. And the enhanced excitability, on the other hand, can increase the output of the, uh, of the hippocampus. That presumably will open up the gate for the transfer, the, trans, uh, the uh, transporting of the information from the hippocampus to other, to higher order of brain area. And uh, of course, we have a, a lot of more important experiments to do actually to make the leap of faith here, but that's um, what we are at now. So as I said, before you guys ask a question, these are the questions that we're asking us every day. And uh, I put these questions up, it's because I, we don't have all of the data for these. So the burning question now is that, so is there any kind of specificity uh, there? Are all neurons in hippocampus upregulated, or is only a subpopulation of neurons uh, upregulated at a very high level? Is this synaptic uh, specific? Is it um, only happening in the dendrite? Or if it is, how long will it stay at the dendrite, uh, at the uh, localization of the activi active synapse before it actually diffuses away towards to the other, um, the uh, proximal dendritic region? And uh, so, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a metaplasticity molecule, but uh, Huang Yi is going to do the uh, uh, plasticity curve to tell me whether it's true or not. And we're only looking at activity-dependent translation. And we know there are quite in reaching information in the, in the gene that also in, indicative of a trans, transcriptional level of control. How that plays out in terms of the animal behavior and learning, we don't know yet. And um, so and this is a little dirty secret I want to tell you before you ask me. The virus manipulation we're doing is five to 10 days. So, and then the, uh, the, the, the regulation of neurogranin level, so we're looking at in behavior and in culture is within minutes. So we are talking about a very different time scale. The effect we are seeing in the neuronal property, is it for real the acute regulation of neurogranin levels or is it actually a consequence of compensation? We don't know. And that's, uh, we're developing tools to look at that. Um, so, and other brain regions, I know a lot of you guys who are interested in striatum, cortex, and amygdala. And uh, how are they, how is neurogranin regulated in other brain regions? We have very minimal amount of information on that. We know it's regulated, but we haven't done the well-controlled experiment to look into that. So, I think I can, I probably can share. <laughs> so, and um, so, and then the grand idea, um, it's, I want to kind of um, promote is that um, in the past few decades, we have been talking about synaptic plasticity, specificity of the information. And I want to point out as a uh, neurophysiologist, a cellular neurophysiologist, now I start to look at picture at a much more broader point of view that um, the regulation of the neuronal properties and functions are happening at very multiple levels. It's not only a simple synaptic plasticity, there are plasticity of the intrinsic uh, membrane properties that have been shown. And then uh, so the enzymatic pathways can be regulated 
And also here I'm telling you that even the constitutive calcium influx can be regulated at that level. And uh, not only that, there are many, many uh, at multiple layers, these uh, neuronal properties can be regulated. And we have to look at the uh, time scale of this manipulation that not only at this uh, millisecond short term plasticity level and uh, post phosphorylation, dephosphorylation that happens within seconds and minutes. And uh, 10 to 60 minutes after the stimulation, we see changes in protein levels. And 30 to 30 minutes to our, um, hours to days after, we see messenger changes and then consequently protein changes. And then these kind of um, uh, time scales are overlapping with each other, highly regulated, that eventually uh, manifest as the uh, proper learning behavior of the animal. And um, so the neuroguanine could be a, uh, I call at this, at least at this 30 minutes time, time window is a gating molecule that kind of facilitate plasticity. It probably, it could be, but I'm not a, I'm not convinced that it's, it, it marks the uh, active synapse. Even if it marks the active synapse, it diffuses away from that point very quickly. We've done uh, experiments, uh, photo ablation of uh, GFP fused neuroguanine. It does not stay, it acts like a GFP. So even though it, it possibly can be generated as an MD receptor at a synapse, but it probably diffuses away fairly quickly. And so basically highlighting the proximal dendrite and later on highlight the whole neuron. Um, and ch uh, by changing its calcium cal module in dynamics. So these are the uh, things that I'm thinking day, day to day, and I don't have all the answers of that, but it keeps me busy for the rest of few years. And I just want to thank, uh, uh, highlight that uh, all of about 200 uh, Western blots were done by Kendrick Jones. The actual physiology work our primer is, uh, is um, done by a graduate student, Huang Yi, and uh, Yan pretty much helped the lab float as our lab manager. Rajiv did uh, initial modeling on your granny and cow modeling. And uh, Stacy was a lab manager, did a quite a lab uh, technician, quite a bit of work on the molecular cloning side. And Chris just joined the lab to uh, strengthen our behavior um, work. And uh, this is a relatively new area of my um, study, and I don't. I honestly don't have a lot of expertise in the stuff that I'm talking about other than the electrophysiology area. So we actually got a, quite a bit of help through Building 46. Uh, Miriam uh, helped us um, uh, design our experiments in terms of polysomal um, reaction. And then Yingxi uh, Kartik uh, helped us for the setting up behavior paradigm. And also Tracy and Mike Lewis from Tracy's lab helped us on some stress um, experiments. And then um, we use Li Hui's labs, equipment, people, expertise all the time. Emily is helping us out um, from Bear's lab on some um, um, follow-up work on the uh, protein synthesis, um, um, activity-dependent protein synthesis um, as well. So, and then the, the work is primarily funded by Stanley Center's um, seed grant and um, um, PCAR um, um, fund. So thank you for all. I think uh, we haven't done the pure PSD prep, but um, 
I think Ken did some synaptosomal preparation. We don't see too much of a difference of uh, level expression. If it's anything, he saw a hint of upregulation after activity stimulation. So, um, but we are, it's not, we, we haven't followed up on that yet. So, and in terms of the translational control, the 5' prime UTR of neurogranin is, um, so there is one study suggests there's an iris um, sequencing in the 5' prime UTR that might introduce um, an additional entry site for the uh, translation initiation. And the CAN has some preliminary data suggesting that there might be alternative splicing in the 5' prime UTR. So we are talking about two different species of uh, messenger RNA. One could be constitutive, the other one could be regulated, but we have no evidence on that yet. Martha? So, so do you have any idea how much <coughs> message, I guess if you haven't done the synapse, so a number of years ago, we showed that EF2 with Gustinger, um, that, that EF2 elongation factor is very rapidly phosphorylated. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, that what, so what that does is it halts all progression mm -hmm. along the ribosome. And any abundant transcript, or the most abundant transcripts, therefore get very rapidly transported. Mm -hmm. Cam kinase 2 was one. There were several other proteins never tracked down with other proteins, mm -hmm. but I think you should look at the two Yeah, yeah. Because it's that, it, it, it's, it's basically a very, very rapid way of controlling, very local, well, AJ Sheets actually did it in synaptic neurosomes, mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very rapid. Mm -hmm. And Gus has the antibody. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, one of the directions we were thinking about, and then Ken got distracted by the behavior stuff, so we haven't followed up on the uh, translation initiation, the factors, phosphorylation. It's, yeah, it's yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Mm yeah. -hmm. What's known at a biochemical level about how neurogranin binding to calmodulin affects or is affected by calcium binding and other target activation by uh, calmodulin? So um, a lot of the study, I think John probably will have better answer than I do. A lot of these uh, biochemical, biochemical study was done in vitro by purified protein. So the uh, take home uh, message is that neurogranin binds to calmodulin when there's no calcium. And um, so when calcium concentrations increased to a absurd, absurd level, I would say, they uh, calmodulin and neurogranin will dissociate. However, uh, the, in the neuron context, if calcium is elevated enough, PKC will get uh, activated. And PKC uh, phosphorylation of neurogranin would um, definitely disrupt the interaction to release, release calmodulin from neurogranin. And when neurogranin is bound to calmodulin, the calcium binding to calmodulin has a faster off rate. That means calmodulin will have a less of a opportunity to be saturated by uh, four calcium. Um, so that, that also suggests that when that is, it, at that stage, cal, cam K2 is harder to be saturated. And taking into consideration, this is a dynamic process. So what happens if uh, neurogranin gets phosphorylated, then all of a sudden you have calmodulin released into the system with uh, free calcium, then you actually have a spike of the uh, calcium saturating calmodulin to actually have a, I would think, a better opportunity to activate CAM K2. That's all very pure theoretical kind of uh, sketchy, um, picture and we don't have solid data on that. John probably will eventually. Well, wait, yeah. you yes. think that it's the calcium when you overstress near granin, is it the sink that binds up calmodulin that's important or is it the increase in free calcium that might be important? Because presumably there's less calmodulin around and you're just increasing free calcium at the synapse. I think uh, neurons handles calcium very efficiently. Even if you don't have enough calmodulin, neurons will find a way to control the cal intracellular calcium concentration to a degree. But uh, so what we have seen in a heterologous system is that if we co-express neurogranin and GCAMP2, which has a well-typed 
uh, CAL module in it, we see a decrease of GCAM2 signal, so, which means that uh, the resting level calcium bound CAL module is lower in that case. We haven't done calcium indicator, but my prediction is that if you go in neuron, I don't think the, the basal level calcium would, in, would change. I think the key word is the, so, uh, dynamics. I think it, the dynamics changes. It's not a static picture. So, yeah. Sorry, Mark. Mark. Um, so, so, some few years ago, uh, Cliff Abraham described this phenomenon of LTP priming, where uh, a brief train of stimulation delivered, oh, a few minutes before a stronger tetanus would enhance LTP. And he showed that that was dependent on new translation, new protein synthesis. And um, that it's triggered by, at least in part, there's a requirement for metabolism of the glutamate receptors, at least in CA1. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering if you thought that maybe what you're describing here is a <laughs> basis for LTP priming and whether this name would argue. Could be. I think I've asked Ken to do the DHPG experiment. He saw a hint of upregulation, but it's not reaching significant yet. It all depends on the stimulation pattern. I don't think he particularly isolated MGUR signaling in that case, right? So he needs to do the right experiment. Yeah. So, so I guess yes. Paul, Paul Worley has shown that EF2 plus correlation mm -hmm. yeah. is driven by the metabotropic. Yeah. 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 So you get it either way. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll have two final questions and then we'll hit the happy hour. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so do you know of any conditions that lead to the a decrease in neurogranin levels, and then also when you see the rapid increase, say when you expose them to a novel environment and see something just a few minutes later, mm -hmm. do you know how long that persists for? Okay, so the first question, whether we saw downregulation, that's actually among the first couple of behavior experiments we did. We did MK01 IP injection in the animals as a psychosis inducer that profoundly decreased neurogranin levels in striatum cortex also have a compass? No? All of them? Okay. And the chronic MK01 injection also does that. So, um, and the second question was, uh, how long does it last? I think, uh, so have you, have you gone further out than 30 minutes? We haven't gone uh, out for 30 minutes. I think um, the initial spike is very neuronal activity driven. And um, later on, my guess is that um, at 60 minutes, transcription regulation probably start to kick in, either compensatorily downregulated or do something else. Because there are papers suggest that if you do epilepsy or contextual fear conditioning and look at the messenger levels of neurogranin at uh, half an, I, I want to say two to six hours after, the messenger RNA is actually downregulated. Could it be a compensatory downregulation mechanism there? So there is a competing mechanism there. How that plays out at a cell autonomous level, I don't know. So yeah, I think it's um, it definitely has a spike, and afterwards, um, things become complicated. Let's put it that way. So uh, I'm not really puzzled by the observation that um, in the neurogranin knockout, it's, it's really hard to get LTP. Because superficially, you'd say, oh, now you've liberated all the calmodulin, uh, which normally would be sort of held mm -hmm. uh, by neurogranin. And so you think, well, maybe things would get more uh, excitable and more plasticity. But then we uh, heard about the following fact, that in the neurogranin knockout, the overall calmodulin levels go way down. And so apparently what the, uh, what the cells are regulating is their free calmodulin, keeping that constant. So the total calmodulin available is now actually much lower. Mm -hmm. So I think what would be really fascinating to, to, to see in your animals is whether calmodulin, but the total calmodulin is also uh, tracking uh, neurogranin changes that you see. We haven't done it uh, systematically, but from a few blots we've done, I don't see like a striking changes in calmodulin levels that would say, whoa, there's something wrong there. 
So, but in terms of the, uh, in terms of how lack of neurogranin, I think neurogranin actually increases the system's sensitivity. If you don't have neurogranin, everything blends out. I would think without neurogranin, even calmodulin is at the basal level, then your basal calcium saturated calmodulin, like all the, uh, the calmodulin that can activate PP2B is probably more comparing to the wild type condition. So you're basically having, a, you would have a hard time to actually kick, because instead of having a spike, you have a slow ramping without neurogranin in the level, so that could be deficit, um, a deficit why LTP is not happening. But that's just my guess. We hopefully will eventually set up the two photon to do the right experiment to look at the calcium signaling and calmodulin signaling. So. Great, so I hope you all join us for some uh, beer and food. <laughs> Their neurogram level for some business.